Uh, this is Dirk Jan van den Heuvel, uh, Director of Software and Security Division at uh, UL. UL stands for Underwriters Laboratory. May I say it's the equivalent, the American equivalent of our KEMA? Or do I? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. is that yeah. our KEMA? Yes. Um, Dirk Jan is, uh, is uh, Vice President, Executive Director of Software and Security uh, within UL. Uh, he, before that, he had his own company, uh, Collis, which was acquired by uh, UL. Uh, in 2012, and uh, Dirk Jan is still working for uh, uh, UL and focusing uh, on setting up, setting up a new division focused on cybersecurity services in the world of Internet of Things. And, well, you're going to talk about security of the Internet of Things. Right, thank okay. you. Okay, good luck. Also, thank you for inviting me and our organization to present here on this uh, interesting conference. <coughs> um, like what you say, I represent UL here, Underwriters Laboratories. The company started more than 100 years ago in Chicago. Uh, there was a big fire and the insurance companies did not like it, uh, especially because the fire was caused by electricity. So that's how UL was established, to study uh, electrical safety, fire safety, to make guidelines, standards, um, and, and uh, start all kinds of certification processes. And that's how the American society knows a lot about UL, especially if it comes to safety. The mission of the, world, the company is to make the world a safer place. About a decade back, uh, UL concluded that there's more than just pure physical safety. That, um, well, there is even uh, no physical safety anymore without security. So um, there was some more focus on building yeah, electronic security and conformance and compliance services. Uh, what happened is that <coughs> uh, one of the things is that four years ago, my company was acquired based in Leiden, and that company plus a few others, uh, out of that uh, unit was constructed, constructed uh, called Transaction Security. It focuses on payment security. And a nice thing about payment security is that in a world of uh, yeah, payments, uh, think about Visa and MasterCard and card payment-like things or mobile payment-like things, security is pretty well organized. Uh, of course, there's still hacks taking place and there's still theft of all kinds of data, but in general, I would say that security is quite properly organized compared to a lot of other uh, industries. Um, well, UL uh, certifies lots of devices, <coughs> electronic devices for safety, electrical safety and conformance to all kinds of wireless standards and battery safety and um, responsible sourcing and uh, chemical uh, safety and those kind of things. But today, uh, if it comes to those yeah, general purpose electrical devices, um, well, the company doesn't check for security, or not much at least. And that is common practice in the world of IoT, that security is, well, not the first priority. So that's why um, uh, the UL top management asked myself and some colleagues uh, to move on from payment security into the world of IoT security and to build a practice to uh, evaluate products and systems in the world of IoT. I started on a challenge, uh, well, uh, a bit less than a year ago. And, um, well, what I uh, can present is where we stand right now. Uh, it's just a start. More to come, but I can give you, uh, say, a tip of the iceberg of what's going on in the world of IoT. Um, no surprise for you, I think, that um, if you look to the world of IoT, that there are many new devices connected to the Internet every day. And according to Gartner and Forrester and those kind of companies, it's about 10 billion this year uh, devices that are connected, growing to... 20 or maybe even 50 billion in 2020. There are all kind of nice graphs that go with those uh, forecasts from those uh, analytical firms. You see they're not all equal, but the question is also how you can count the devices. I think what is very clear is that this is a growth market. It's growing rapidly, and well, they mostly predict that the growth is uh, yeah, about 20 to 30% per year in number of devices that get connected to the internet. Uh, you may wonder hey, what, uh, yeah, what is a device being connected to the internet and what is an IoT device? Well, uh, OWASP, uh, well known to you, I assume, says that uh, an IoT device, according to them, is an everyday object 
uh, having network connectivity allowing them to send and receive data. Um, but in general, it's about, yeah, say objects that in the past were not connected to the internet and nowadays contain electronics, contain software, and get a connection to the outside world to exchange all kinds of data uh, that may yeah, make your life more easy. If you take the health world, for instance, then I'm pretty sure that yeah, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, lots of systems were not connected, uh, were not even connected to the internet. Um, so in a hospital, things were quite uh, closed uh, and locked and uh, had lots of archives still on paper. Uh, today, everything is stored in data centers, uh, is connected within the hospital, but also with outside care providers like the pharmacy or your uh, practitioner or other uh, care providers. And uh, as a consumer yourself, you may have all kind of uh, health or uh, yeah, uh, life-oriented devices too that may even interact with the doctor's systems or the hospital systems. So there's a whole ecosystem of uh, yeah, devices and systems uh, that uh, focus on life and health. And they're connected through all kinds of protocols and standards and, and uh, now what have you to exchange data and to, uh, to make sure that um, well, the communication flows well. Uh, on the one hand, that may uh, look very complex. On the other hand, uh, we all know that this could yeah, save your life or, uh, or, or stretch your life or reduce the risk or, well, in the end, make your life more easy. On the other hand, we are here on a security conference. Uh, this all brings security risks, of course. There's so many interfaces, so many protocols, so many layers in those protocols. So a lot of threats, a lot of risks, if we don't pay sufficient attention to security in those ecosystems. And this is just one. Uh, this is a drawing that shows that there are many, many more ecosystems. Um, I'm sure that you heard about them. Smart meters, smart lighting, smart uh, electronics, connected cars, connected homes, uh, smart appliances, smart grids, uh, smart logistics, uh, well, healthcare, patient monitoring. Um, I just took this uh, drawing from somewhere, and uh, of course I missed my uh, famous uh, uh, payment domain. Uh, I've grown up in the payment security domain. It's not shown here, but that is another industry uh, that yeah, uses IoT and security quite a lot. Um, if you take the retail space, it was just presented in the legal track here. They also make use of uh, all kind of uh, IoT-like techniques. So there are lots of industries, and I think, well, across the society, uh, ne nearly all industries that somehow touch base with sensors and IoT and connecting devices to the internet. So everyone touches uh, yeah, this topic and uh, faces the challenge on how to secure those systems. The good news is that as you well, um, well, we are a 12,000 uh, uh, employee company. We see lots of devices passing our labs. And historically, we test all those devices for EMC, uh, for wireless conformance protocols, for chemical safety, for battery safety. So in general, when you take a monitor or a laptop or your phone, uh, most likely it has been uh, tested or certified in many ways already by UL. But one thing, and I shouldn't say it that loud here, but so far security doesn't get too much attention. And that is not only about UL, because UL has been talking to the industry already quite some time, but it's our, say, joint problem. Um, I think that the perception has been uh, for a long time that uh, if you make your network secure, you put some firewalls around and, well, uh, 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 hey, you monitor with IDS and IPS what happens, then in general, well, what kind of components you use in your network is not too important. But the recent breaches have shown that for sure it is important what kind of devices, what kind of hardware, what kind of yeah, systems you use within your network. So not looking to security is no option anymore. We need altogether to look to security. But of course that is a joint effort because yeah, somehow you want to define levels and benchmarks and, and standards. Uh, of minimum criteria where you have to uh, yeah, conform to to ensure sufficient security for a consumer product, 
for a healthcare product, for whatever kind of product. So we have a joint challenge to define good frameworks to test and certify devices in the space of IoT. Um, and we may say, okay, uh, let's start a process and let's take some time. Uh, but the question is, how big is the threat? Um, well, these are some numbers from uh, the analytical firms like Gartner and Forrester again. And we can argue the numbers. Um, the question is always what they mean. But well, the essence of the story is that lots of uh, devices that are connected to the internet today, and I'm sure that management Gurka can confirm that too, are full of vulnerabilities, even known vulnerabilities, um, things for which you can easily find an exploit on the internet. So hackers, well, the other track uh, gives you a hacker course, uh, but they easily can learn on how to hack such um, IoT devices. And hey, you may say, well, such a microphone or uh, well, a simple uh, thing uh, uh, connected to a network, hey, is, it, is it too bad if you hack such a thing? But it could be that uh, through the microphone or through the smart fridge or even through the smart uh, lamp um, uh, or light, you can enter the full network. Lots of breaches have shown that that can happen. So um, uh, the fact that there are known vulnerabilities in all kinds of systems really is a big threat. And some organizations have faced uh, 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 already being breached or hacked through those uh, entries and others will face being hacked through those uh, devices unless, unless we together uh, make it more secure. So some uh, examples of uh, breaches that happened over the last few years. Um, there are many, many more, of course, but the Target breach, uh, I think it was mentioned here last year too. Uh, Target, a big retail store in the US. Uh, hackers, Ukrainian hackers came in through uh, the HVAC maintenance system some kind of hardware, hardware device, uh, they came in. Um, and there was a vulnerability in there and they could enter through there and get access to the full network of uh, the full uh, target stores in the US. They could collect all kinds of payment data from the POS devices, copy or counterfeit the cards, and uh, it resulted in a loss of more than 300 million for the target stores. Well, we all know that retail uh, well, has quite some difficulty today, uh, not only in Europe, also in the US. So this was a big shame for Target. And uh, ultimately, the CEO resigned, the CFO was fired, and some more people were fired because of the big shame. On the other hand, um, well, the question is whether their network was that worse compared to others. I think it's all yeah, linked to the fact that uh, many people do not see that a um, very silly backdoor uh, can have, have very bad consequences unless you have designed your network for better security. <coughs> so target is one. Uh, another, that was maybe not so much a, a, a breach, but more a, a hack uh, on the Hospira infusion pump. Uh, also last year, um, uh, on a conference in the US, it was shown that um, uh, an infusion pump could be hacked and that you easily could uh, change the volume of, uh, of uh, uh, infusion to the patient. And as a uh, yeah, fun joke, uh, they showed then on the display patient dead at some point. Well, that was bad um, uh, advertisement for Hospira, of course. Uh, they were put on the blacklist by the American government and they suffered a lot from this bad reputation of not taking care of security that well for all their clients. Um, but there are other examples as, as well about Medtronic and Boston uh, Health <laughs> and, and all kinds of health companies where their devices got hacked. In a very similar manner, happened in the automotive industry uh, a few hacks. The most famous one was mentioned this morning already, um, the Jeep Cherokee hack. Uh, if you didn't see the video on the internet yet, then please uh, have a look. It's really funny on how some hackers um, yeah, take control over the full car, uh, the engine, uh, the steering wheel, the brakes, uh, they can control everything ultimately, and they show how to drive the, um, the car from the road. Um, well, that's really life-threatening if that happens by, by, by uh, yeah, um, how you say, hackers that really hack uh, things with a bad intent. This was more for demo purposes, but if it happens in real life, well, 
we could be all very worse uh, if that happens. And uh, it didn't end there. There are other brands of which the cars got hacked as well. Uh, two weeks ago, there was a conference in London. Uh, I showed a nice demo about how a Mitsubishi was being hacked by faking the mobile app. And uh, well, that was maybe not life threatening, but at least they could control the, the whistles and the, the, the lights and, the, uh, and uh, opening the, um, the trunk and these kind of funny things. <laughs> um, the car industry was not prepared for uh, having secure cars and having secured their cars sufficient against hackers and all kinds of threats that may happen. Um, if you take the world of, uh, say, um, home electronics, Domotica, uh, LG, Samsung have been accused a lot from uh, getting too, gathering too much data with their smart TVs and, um, and, and, and uh, other electronic devices because they put a lot of the, say, the user profiles in the cloud without informing, without the permission from the user, which is against the privacy regulations, of course. So they came in bad news because of those kind of things. Moreover, it was demonstrated that you could hack into a Samsung Smart TV and take control over the camera in that TV, which is not so nice either, of course, if you get yeah, spied by hackers that uh, yeah, can just see what you do in your living room. Um, so lots of examples of, say, devices that got hacked, and through those devices, maybe even worse things happened. A very recent example, uh, the Central Bank of Bangladesh uh, got hacked. Uh, you probably heard about that uh, news. What happened is that hackers uh, somehow hacked into a printer, and through the printer, they got access to the core banking system of the bank, and through that, they got access to the uh, SWIFT network for interbanking uh, wire transfers. Well, they are for sure much smarter than I am, but the fact that you can go in that manner through the network and, uh, well, they stole uh, about $100 million, which is a lot, of course, for a, com for a country like Bangladesh. Um, well, they tried to transfer another $900 million. They failed on that part. <laughs> uh, but it shows that, uh, yeah, um, a very small um, a weakness, a small uh, uh, um, a vulnerability, can lead in the end to a big disaster. So the idea of just protecting the network and uh, well, not caring about what kind of devices you use in your network is, if you ask me, old fashioned. You really have to pay attention also to the security of the individual components you use in your network. And whether that are uh, devices or uh, software or servers or applications, um, make sure that, um, well, around all of those components, there is sufficient security so that if hackers yeah, uh, enter through one ring, that they do not come to the next layer. Um, well, I, I'm sure that you know many more examples yourself. Uh, sorry, maybe one more that to mention here, um, uh, if it comes to device security. Uh, you heard probably about the Stuxnet uh, um, uh, attack as well. Uh, that was some kind of counterattack uh, to, to, to break down the, uh, Iran, sorry, uh, the in Iran, the uranium uh, factory, the enrichment factory. So what they did was they used uh, some kind of uh, uh, vulnerability in the Siemens software to break the factory, and right now it doesn't function anymore. So that was a smart hack from the, uh, well, the uh, security authorities to, to stop that from happening. But in general, there is a threat because of uh, yeah, not paying sufficient attention uh, in products, in IoT products that we put in the field. And if you take a car, for instance, today, uh, and you may think about that being one IoT device, and I, I think in the gardener and forest they're counting, it counts like one device. But in practice, we all know that it is full of all kinds of controllers and all kinds of electronics. Uh, and there's a lot of yeah, internal communication in the car itself as well, among all those contro uh, control <coughs> units. And for fraudsters, for hackers, this is really like uh, the paradise, I would say, because there are so many entries and so many methods and so many ways to, to enter into the car and the security of the car. Um, that, well, so far, uh, quite a few managed to get in and to hack the car. So if you look to, uh, yeah, external interfaces, uh, there is Wi-Fi, there is Bluetooth, there is uh, the, the 4G network, 
uh, there may be NFC connections in the car. But if you then go through one of those interfaces into the electronics of the car, then most often uh, everything is connected, uh, for instance, uh, through the CAN bus. The CAN bus itself is in most cases not <coughs> encrypted yet, no authentication yet. So if you reach that, uh, that, that bus, uh, then you can send all kinds of communication uh, to uh, whatever system in the car and uh, yeah, confuse the complete electronics in the car, which is very, very risky. So the car industry is aware that this needs to change, but they are thinking, they are breathing, they are uh, talking. Uh, as you well, we are a bit involved in that, but there's still a long way to go to really secure the car in a better manner. So we have a joint challenge to, to improve the security. And the sad thing is that uh, the target, if you ask me, is even moving. Because this is not a static world, uh, but uh, like what I said, the number of IoT devices growth. But it's not only about the number, it's also about the complexity of those devices. We move more data into the cloud. Uh, we, uh, um, um, on, uh, we expect from every device that it is remote updatable. Uh, we use uh, wearables. <coughs> we speak about bring your own device, like in the last talk. More sensors uh, enter into all those devices. Instead of uh, always the using, user triggering the communication, it's a lot of M2M, -M, the machine autonomous communicating with another machine. So there are lots of trends that really ask for more uh, security in those devices, in the communication, and also for better protection of the privacy. Uh, I didn't write here the, the legal frameworks, but well, in the previous uh, presentation, it was stressed already, the GDPR uh, regulation in Europe. In other countries, there are similar things. Privacy, we should take better care of that. And as a result, the analyt analytical firms say that um, had the security market in general grows is about 10% per year. The IoT market grows between 20 and 30% per year. But if it comes to IoT security, that grows faster than 30% per year. That's what they predict. On the other hand, uh, if you ask me, hey, do we feel that we are in a, in a growth market right now and is the work coming in and is it all clear what needs to be done? Quite frankly, not. We are still in quite a confused phase of uh, how to test IoT, how to improve the security uh, of IoT, and, and what is the best way forward. So to me, this is still a bit of a, say, an exploratory phase, but I do expect that over the coming years, we will get much stricter regulation uh, on the security of IoT because of the increasing risk um, and all the things that come with that. Um, well, why does it take a bit of time to find out how to do it? Um, well, I'm not sure how um, yeah, uh, uh, engaged you are with the IoT world. But the IoT world itself is not, say, one world. Um, it's all kind of consortia, all kind of standards, all kind of layers in the communication. Uh, the next slide shows that in a bit different manner. Uh, but there are protocols that focus on long range communication, others on short range. Uh, some uh, uh, try to save the battery uh, or are even passive. Uh, others are uh, uh, focusing on uh, high speed communication. Um, some of them focus on the lower layers of the communication, others focus more on the, uh, the, the service or the application layers. Um, there are all kinds of uh, standards for all kinds of things. Um, and honestly, there are also quite a few double standards. So uh, all seen in uh, Open Internet Consortium, uh, they recently decided to merge because they were both uh, going for the same aim, more or less. So they become OCF. Uh, they have another consortium that competes with them. Uh, it's called One M2M, and uh, One M2M uh, is Etsy and ITU, and uh, well, there's a whole uh, group of uh, other um, organizations behind. Uh, they have a quite a smart approach because they, they try to do some kind of catch-all uh, approach, uh, where they say uh, uh, One M2M also integrates with OCF and with Thread and with all kind of other consortia and standards. Whether in practice it is that simple as they claim uh, is all to be seen because a lot of this is still moving and under development. Um, I take a few examples because as you well we are involved in those. Um, Google uh, started the Thread Consortium. Um, it uses Zigbee and some other technologies underneath. Uh, so it's built on top of. 
And the idea is to yeah, build some kind of home domotica-like uh, system. Uh, there are other uh, um, systems that partly use threat, partly compete with uh, threats. Uh, so there's uh, Apple with HomeKit. Uh, there's Samsung with uh, SmartThings. Uh, there's LG, uh, slightly different SmartThink with a Q. <laughs> so they always compete with Samsung. Uh, well, there's all kind of consortia and, and, and standards on how to use, um, how to build a domotica system where systems connect and can interact and can exchange data. Um, as UL, we build currently a lab for especially interoperability, uh, but they allow us also to do security evaluation of uh, threat consortium components. And these focus on uh, the alarm system in the, in the house, uh, the, the, the fridge, uh, the uh, doorbell, the video camera, uh, all kinds of things in the house can connect uh, through uh, the threat standards. And what we do is focus on interop first. That was the request of threat. And we said, but security, well, we think it's as important. And then I said, okay, feel free to evaluate that too. Uh, it's not part of the, say, the order. <laughs> Um, but we are going to demonstrate in the coming time that security is important and that we should have a yeah, evaluation framework for that as well in order to ensure that this system works as a whole in a secure manner. Uh, UL is also involved in the Industrial uh, Internet Consortium, IIC. Um, well, in Europe, that's also quite well known uh, with the term Industry 4.0 which is a very German term, <clears throat> but it's about process automation in factories, uh, often unmanned, and all kinds of machines and things do interact and yeah, are connected uh, through electronics, through software, um, and of course that should be secure as well, uh, because if you have a, yeah, a complex factory, you don't want that uh, yeah, uh, things mix up and that everything explodes and goes wrong and, and those kind of things. So the security of those uh, yeah, processes and systems is quite important. And uh, happily, IIC uh, understood that, and they have a security program in place. Um, and uh, while well, we are one of the uh, companies that provide a test bed, a test lab for IIC components. To be quite frank, that is also still a bit early days. They understand the importance, and they have something in place, but there is still a lot more to ensure sufficient security in those systems. Um, so to summarize a bit about, say, all those IoT initiatives, because there are about 200 different initiatives that we identified, um, and it's a bit in line with what was said uh, this morning by Ralph Monen. Um, uh, some consortia, some protocol layers, they don't care about security. It's not in and don't count on it. It's simply not in. Uh, and then on a higher level layer, you should build it in to ensure that communication goes well. Um, but what we see is that uh, right now a lot is left over to the, well, to the implementer of the device. And if you have an ecosystem of which half the devices are quite properly secured and the other half not, or even worse, if everything is secure except one or two, well, we all know that there are security threats and risks uh, by those devices that do not live up to the level. So um, we are very convinced that uh, in the coming time, all those consortia, especially those from, say, Samsung and Apple, those that yeah, have a brand promise to the client, uh, will uh, need to take uh, security more serious, and that all kinds of security programs have to be put in place. Uh, I would like to give you an update uh, next year and a year after, but I'm pretty sure that all kinds of security programs will be put in place uh, that go way beyond what happens today, because today there are um, yeah, implementation guidelines and there are maybe some specifications, but in most of those initiatives there is n no testing, no certification uh, um, uh, obliged. Um, and, uh, of course, like what we discussed earlier today, you want to do a lot through a uh, secure de development lifecycle. You want to avoid a lot of errors. But in the end, and that's what uh, Madison and we as a company know quite well, in the end, you still need to do some checks to ensure that things have done, been done properly. And ideally, you do it through a third party, uh, because yeah, a vendor in general, if they say that they conform to something, it doesn't guarantee too much. 
Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done. And um, partly we do that through those consortia. Like what I said, we participate in IIC and in the Threat Consortium. Uh, but we also felt that that is not enough. Uh, there is some common denominator uh, uh, of services that we could offer uh, for the other uh, consortia and other uh, well, application areas too. So that's why uh, we wanted to make some kind of uh, yeah, common framework too. And then first of all, we look to what is available, what kind of yeah, security evaluation frameworks are available. Some of you may know about common criteria, which is a uh, well, government initiative on how to evaluate uh, security. Um, as you well, we run various CC labs as well, so we know CC quite well. And for certain products, um, if you think about encryption products or uh, banking products or uh, government ID uh, things, well, CC may be a very good method to well, somehow evaluate against certain levels. However, uh, in general, it is perceived as quite cumbersome, quite formal, quite uh, a lot of paperwork, uh, quite bureaucratic, lengthy, and expensive. And that for sure doesn't work for consumer devices and for yeah, more fast-moving uh, applications. Um, so we had lengthy debate with all kind of uh, industry partners, but uh, more or less everyone says, well, for the day-to-day -day products, uh, please don't uh, uh, push CC. We don't need that. That doesn't work. Uh, especially in the U.S., uh, CC is uh, being perceived as quite uh, quite bad and also a bit like more European. Uh, so by definition, they don't like it so much. Um, and that will not do. Uh, in the U.S., there's another program called FIPS. Uh, well, some of you may know that as well, but it's very much for encryption devices and not for general uh, yeah, purpose IoT devices. So those kind of things, yeah, don't bring us the solution. And uh, I myself... I'm still very surprised that there are no better and more frameworks available right now for general purpose, but there simply are not. And uh, <coughs> that was one of the reasons for us uh, why UL made its own standard, the UL 2900 standard, that soon will become part of ENSI, American National Standard. Uh, so it will move to become an ENSI standard, and maybe ultimately it might be an ISO standard, uh, but at least it's a standard on how to evaluate say, an IoT device in general. Over time, we expect all kinds of flavors to come because uh, an IoT device for healthcare is a different one than for domotica or for automotive. So there will be all kinds of uh, deltas and flavors on top. Uh, but for the moment, uh, it's at least uh, more than nothing. And it gives a framework on how to yeah, benchmark, how to test, how to evaluate uh, electronics. Um, well, that initiative uh, was taken by us, uh, but the funny thing is that uh, last year, uh, the American government also knocked on our door and said, um, well, UL, you have written all kinds of standards for safety, for physical safety. We need you for the world of IoT as well and for security. And then we said, okay, we're working on that, and well, actually, we can make it a joint initiative. So our initiative is really endorsed by and stimulated by the American government and not too much to make it an American flavor or a bit like the NSA stories that we heard this morning, uh, not like that, but more like <coughs> um, well, um, uh, a push uh, in the right direction uh, to build something for the general purpose IoT world. Um, in a very similar um, way, we are talking to ENISA in Europe, uh, because ENISA, uh, which is uh, the uh, Information so uh, Society for the European Union, also feels that, yeah, to protect uh, inhabitants better, uh, we need frameworks, we need uh, uh, things to be in place to improve the security. And they're also very interested in this initiative. Over time, <coughs> we are more than happy to donate the whole thing to the international community and to make it completely open source. We want to be a test lab, not even the test lab, just a test lab to test according to those kind of standards. But we're working on that, uh, those standards and on, well, getting the ball rolling. Uh, at least we have the White House and uh, Obama uh, in favor of us. Uh, Obama uh, put our uh, initiative uh, in his uh, national action plan that he launched four months back. And uh, the nice thing is that, uh, well, uh, more than half of the standard uh, is written here in Netherlands. So it's quite funny to see that they push that in the US. 
Um, well, I don't want to take too much time from you about the standards and, and to make it too, too, too boring, say. Uh, but to explain a little more about it, um, there is, a, say, a general standard on how we can uh, evaluate uh, yeah, software in an embedded device. And then on top of that, we have made two addenda already, one focused on uh, healthcare and one focused uh, on uh, industrial control systems. We intend to write other addenda for automotive, for mobile apps, and well, what have you later on. So those are standards that are out already. Then uh, there are some other standards that we plan to make. One is to assess an organization, uh, because a device can be like this one, could be perfect, but if the organization behind that device is like a chaos, then yeah, you never know about the next device that is being produced, whether it has the same quality. So somehow, a bit like ISO 27001, or a double check on that, is uh, part of this program too. Um, so the standards are there, and uh, there is a, a, a program on how to test the compliance according to those standards. Um, are those standards already open source? Uh, well, they are, <laughs> that's a bit um, strange, and I feel a little ashamed, to be quite frank. They can be uh, uh, received on request. That is the procedure right now. Uh, I think in NC it's also you have to be a member before you get them. To me, it's completely bullshit. I would like to publish them straight. Uh, but if you need them, send me a message and I will make sure that you get them. So. OK. Um, sorry, about how, what does it describe the standard? What does it address? Uh, so if we take a piece of electronics um, and we want to say something about the security in there, um, uh, of course, we could say in the common criteria method, uh, you have first have to describe your target of evaluation, and you have to write a protection profile, and you have to define all kinds of methods on how you want to attack the thing. And uh, the CC method is very much like uh, case by case, you define your whole strategy and your whole plan and what have you, which makes it very uh, yeah, complex and very time consuming. In our case, uh, we have said, um, of course, you always can do more, but the minimum things that you expect to do is that you check, for instance, whether there are uh, known vulnerabilities in the device. Not even the unknown ones, but at least the known ones should be uh, addressed. Um, and if it comes to malware, well, there's all kinds of tools to check against malware. So let's check against the malware. Um, then uh, if it comes to the source code, uh, well, you can check for weaknesses in there. Are, are there weaknesses, or is it like spaghetti? Is it coded in the wrong manner? We had a presentation this morning by SIG. Hey, what is the quality of the code? That quality says already something about the security of the, um, uh, of the, of the software. So there are all kinds of ways to analyze the uh, quality of the software. And uh, of course, you want to take the, say, the use and the context also into account. So there is also a session on um, security controls. If it is about the banking app, uh, the least thing you expect is that, based on the risk control, that there is a password or some kind of access uh, procedure on how to access the, the app. Uh, and that there is something about encryption or st data storage or, uh, well, all kind of things should be in place in such an IoT device. So in our program, we do some kind of general uh, health check on the security of that software. And what it results in is a report. And if you are happy with that, uh, if, sorry, if the report is positive, then you can achieve a certificate based on that, stating that, well, you went through the process and that so far no big issues have been found. So this is the program that we are launching right now. Um, I'm sure that over time we are going to tweak it and to tune it and to improve it and to make it, say, more vertical specific. Uh, but this is where we are working on, on how to, yeah, uh, at least for the short term, improve the security of IoT products. Uh, this slide explains things in more detail, but I understand that my time is close to over. So for those that want, uh, you can get the deck and um, you can see a bit in a bit more detail what we do in the various steps. Uh, well, the benefits uh, of this program is, is that to the manufacturer, uh, it gives better assurance about the quality of their product. Uh, had, that's better for internal to, to make sure that the work is done properly. It can be used for marketing means as well to, to show uh, that your product 
well, differentiates itself maybe from the competition, or to show to the external world that privacy is taken into account in a proper manner, um, uh, and that you take well care of, uh, of uh, client data or privacy sensitive data. So it can be good for manufacturers. It can also be good for end users or for uh, uh, retail companies that sell the products because they know more about the quality of the product. It feels more reliable, more trustworthy, more secure. And ultimately, and that may still, still sound far away, but we see that a lot in the US. Um, in Europe, hey, you see that um, a lot of security and safety is regulated through um, yeah, government laws and mandates and directives from the EU, etc., and that there's penalties if you don't comply to the law. In the US, uh, in general, the law is weaker, uh, but the liability, as you probably know, is way higher. So uh, instead of talking to the government, you talk more to um, yeah, the, the, the legal people and the insurance companies. And the insurance companies are very, very interested in uh, reducing the risks on the cyber side. So they also show very much interest in those kind of programs. And ideally, they would like to prescribe uh, all kind of yeah, security levels in all their security, in all their insurance policies. So there's all kinds of benefits if altogether uh, we control the risks uh, on the security side in the world of IT better. And that's what uh, we are working on. Well, that's more or less the end of my presentation. Uh, in a short summary, maybe, uh, if you ask me, security in the world of IoT uh, is still in its uh, infancy, is still uh, yeah, uh, early days. The IoT world is growing fast, uh, so that's a double reason, I think, why uh, yeah, we should focus on securing the world of IoT better. Um, it's a moving target, uh, and we have to catch up from things that were not arranged yet. So I do expect that in the coming years, a lot is going to happen in this world, and yeah, it will be put implicit in lots of products and protocols, and it needs lots of companies like uh, Medicine and us to help uh, vendors and uh, suppliers to um, yeah, protect their products better. That's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. One or two short questions. No questions. Ah. ah there's, there's a question yeah. over there. Ah. Then I get <laughs> Oh, does it still work? Yep. All right. So one big difference between um, uh, safety of, for example, electrical products that you certify and security of, of these Internet of Things products and basically anything that's connected is that, uh, in my opinion, the security is not a static property of a device in the sense that new uh, vulnerabilities are discovered on a regular basis. So uh, suppose a product has been certified according to your uh, program and a vulnerability is found in the product. What happens then? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, actually, uh, when I go back in slides, uh, sorry. This is a summary of the standards. And um, well, actually, as part of the base standard, we check already whether the product itself is in a secure manner remote upgradable. Um, so whether it uh, had a secure download and those kind of things. Um, are sufficiently implemented. Um, that's what I would call level one. Uh, but then there's the organization behind, and that's the other standard that I mentioned, um, that is supposed to respond fast on any new zero day or any new vulnerability that is being found. And of course, you have good, need to have good release procedures and good software, uh, secure software development uh, in order to really patch the system in a good manner. Uh, if, if they find something in your car and, and, uh, and they, they make the problem even worse, that's what you don't want, of course. So in the end, uh, the way we want to cover that is yeah, not by checking every release, because that is simply impossible, but by checking a release on day one and then say, okay, the certificate is valid for one or two years, provided that, well, you show us uh, through ISO 27001 or ISO 27034 or some other kind of framework that uh, your uh, secure development lifecycle is well under control and that yeah, you respond sufficiently fast on any incident that may happen. And those two ingredients <coughs> together, well, for the moment, we consider them to be sufficient uh, for ensuring the security to the, uh, um, to, the, to, to the user. Of course, we also keep the right that if they don't respond uh, sufficient well that we withdraw the certificate and that uh, it's game over. 
Um, but that's how we uh, yeah, treat with this right now. And, and well, to make it even more actual, um, we also speak to the European road authorities, for instance, on how to certify cars, because there's a type approval process right now. And well, the word type approval says it already. Uh, you, 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 you certify one car, and then they may sell hundreds of or thousands of those similar cars that they produce, and they're considered to be all static. Uh, but it's bullshit, of course, because with the remote upgradability, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a moving thing. Look at, look at Tesla. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And right now, they don't pay too much attention to it. They all know that they have to pay attention to this, and they come with a very similar answer uh, that, uh, well, uh, you need to check the software on day one. Uh, the company has to prove uh, yeah, stability and, and the right things if it comes to the software secure uh, software development life cycle. And if it comes to major releases, you have to do the type of approval again. But yeah, bug fixes um, or small things, well, trust them to do that uh, because we simply cannot handle all as a road authority. So it, the problem comes back in, uh, in, yeah, in quite a few of those ecosystems. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll conclude this, uh, this lecture. Yeah.